Hi. Um, can everybody hear me? Yes, and we can see you. Okay, great, great. Um, just get the tech stuff out of the way. Um, hi, my name is Arielle Opatowski. Um, I did graduate last year uh, with my PhD from the Department of Engineering Physics. Um, and my advisor was Paul Wilson. He's sent a lot of researchers to CHTC over the years. So um, this is exciting to come represent the group um, with my research topic, which was in the realm of nuclear security. Um, so just a little background on what nuclear security is. Um, according to the IAEA, which is the Atomic International Atomic Energy Association, it's the prevention and detection of and response to all of these bullet points, um, theft or sabotage of, for example, nuclear materials or the facilities that they're associated with. Um, one of the main reasons to do this is to prevent nuclear terrorism. Um, so that can happen through a number of avenues. Um, a nuclear weapon could be stolen um, or nuclear material can be stolen to be needed to a weapon. Um, other nuclear material that's maybe not um, quality, high quality enough to be made into an actual nu nuclear weapon can become still a radioactive dispersal device, an RDD. Um, or the transportation of nuclear materials or a facility can be attacked, and that would be really terrible for the people who live nearby um, and would cause long-term environmental damage. So it's an important um, area of research. Um, my particular uh, area within nuclear security is called nuclear forensics. So this is more of the in response to side of things, a nuclear event has occurred, what do you do next? Um, and in about 2006 or so, the, the United States government um, added an office to the Department of Homeland Security to bolster this capability within our country. And so funding ensued. And then um, when I was in grad school, I got to study it as a result. So um, a little bit more uh, detail about nuclear forensics. Nuclear event, I kind of described on the previous slide in that graphic. Um, there's an intact special nuclear material. Um, my work spoke, focused on spent nuclear fuel, so nuclear fuel, fuel after it's been inside of a nuclear reactor. Um, other events could be the interception of a weapon or an actual explosion of a device. Um, the nuclear forensics focuses on trying to study um, the device design and reconstruct it or measuring things like nuclear signatures, determining the age and history of the material for the purpose of attribution. This isn't done alone. There's intelligence data and other forensics um, that all lead to this. I have bolded the blocks that kind of applied to my research. Um, and so the attribution, and this has to be legally um, sound. So this would have to hold up in court. So it's really important to get this stuff right. Um, but the attribution can determine the origin, which can maybe lead to uh, the group responsible um, or the history of the transportation of material can lead to the group responsible. Um, the need is made a little bit clear in this graphic. Um, I have sourced this from the IAEA again. Um, just showing the incidents since 1993 related to trafficking or malicious use. Um, at the time of my dissertation, I tried to get an updated uh, version of this, but it's a little behind because investigations have to happen. So um, 2019, I don't know if it's still the most recent one, but um, this is, you know, there's anywhere from two to 20 in a given year. Um, and so these are just the ones that were intercepted. Um, and so uh, one more background slide, I have a little bit of detail about nuclear forensics investigations that might motivate my workflow a little bit. Um, so there's this uh, little illustration here where we have this nuclear material sample. Um, I'm looking at spent nuclear fuel, take some measurements, and then this gives some kind of idea um, of the reactor operation history. 
And um, if the information is good enough and we know enough about reactors around the world, you can actually pinpoint the exact reactor that it came from in theory, um, which could be then reported to investigators. Um, I don't want you to worry too much about these, uh, this vocabulary up here, um, you know, finding the reactor type and words that you might not know the meaning of. Um, these are just things that I'm trying to determine with my workflow. Um, and over here, there's more words on the screen that I will not take the time to explain, um, but the most important thing is that there's these different measurements. These are all measurements and time frames. And so in a nuclear forensics investigation, um, there's these measurements that can take months. Um, they're very, very good, very high detail measurements, um, but they take a long time because they have to undergo something called radiochemical separation first. Um, so what my approach did was I'm trying to see if this gamma spectroscopy can expedite an investigation because this can be done in a matter of days versus weeks or months. Um, and so I made a workflow comparing these two approaches, this kind of um, very detailed measurements, which I call slow measurements later on, and then faster measurements, which give less good information but they still might be able to point an investigation in the right direction. So um, my research question is, uh, can a computational approach expedite a nuclear forensics investigation? Um, and I will not answer that for you today because today we are talking about the computational approach and not how to speed up nuclear forensics investigations. Um, so how I first learned about HTC, um, I had a workflow and it stopped working. And as a grad student, I ran to my advisor and was upset about it and didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and of course, he's already sent a number of students over to CHTC. So he sent me there and knew exactly what I needed. Um, and then I got to meet with the CHTC staff. Um, the support was phenomenal. Initially, they introduced us with a one-on-one -on -one introduction and tutorial. Um, incredible help with um, email response and office hours. Um, and once I kind of got the vocabulary down, you know, years in, um, I got some vocabulary down. I used the manual a lot once I really knew what to search for, which is a little bit dangerous for somebody who doesn't quite know what they're doing. So I would never have called myself a power user. I would think of myself as like I graduated, which cut me off mid montage of like becoming the expert, right? So, um, it was a very, it was very helpful, very clear, um, always tons of support um, along the way as my needs changed too. Um, so a little bit about my workflow and why CHTC was needed. Um, I have another infographic illustration here um, with more words on it that I'm not gonna define for you, um, but in a machine learning based workflow, we start with a training data set. Um, so I just have a number of columns that I'm looking for. These are these measurements, the fast and slow measurements I mentioned. Um, so there's a number of features related to that. And then there's something that I'm trying to predict from um, those features given an unknown sample. So the data set goes into an algorithm. Um, maybe we get a model, maybe we don't. Um, and then at the end, we can use a test sample or some real life unknown nuclear material and see if it can give us some prediction of, in this case, something called burnup. Um, and, and since I have simulated this entire training data set myself, I already know all the answers that I'm giving it. Um, in my dissertation, I did use some real world um, unknown samples as well, um, but uh, that's not covered in this talk. Um, so, the workflow, there's tens of case variations. These take a long time to run. Um, that in and of itself brought me to CHTC. Um, the algorithms, I used a, a couple of different algorithms. Those algorithms have hyperparameter variations that were important to study. Um, and then I'm not just predicting this one thing, I'm trying to predict um, a series of things to pinpoint a reactor, for example. So um, I would say the biggest Thing that caused me to need CHTC was the size of the training database. If I had something much smaller, it probably could have run on a laptop, for example. <clears throat> um, so a little more details about my database dimensions. I mentioned the fast measurements and the slow measurements um, and included these pictures. Um, 
uh, kind of showing there's these more exact measurements that take weeks to months. Um, and there's some measurements that can take minutes. Um, and so they, they give different database dimensions. Um, both of these databases had about half a million entries in them, all simulated by me. Um, and uh, the slow measurements had fewer columns, um, about 30. Uh, and then the fast measurements had more because um, it's a completely different type of measurement. Um, and I was getting peaks out of the spectra instead of just numbers of certain um, features. So it's a, it was a decently big database. Um, and I applied it to two categories of computation. Um, I already mentioned the machine wor learning workflow. So um, I used scikit-learn in Python. I used two very simple algorithms. This was kind of a first pass uh, research study. So I wasn't trying to get too fancy too quickly. Um, so this using this type of workflow, it's not necessarily the best match for a system like CHTC. It worked on there, but it wasn't the best use. Um, there's one job per case submission. Um, and there is some parallelism offered by scikit-learn. Um, so I used that, um, but that was that's all I did. Um, and this resulted in some large memory needs for jobs, um, many hours per job. Um, I, I have been gone long enough that I forgot how long they took. I wanna say one to two days um, on the system. And then the other category, uh, is I used a third algorithm that I wrote myself based on other nuclear forensics work, um, conceptually very similar to the scikit-learn algorithms, but since I was writing it myself, um, I could split it up a little better and use the power of CHTC um, to my advantage to have smaller jobs that run faster. Um, so because my database was about 500K entries um, and there's a 10K job limit, I broke it into chunks. Um, so there's about 50 calculations per job. Um, this, as I mentioned, resulted in lower memory needs um, per job. The, each job probably took a few minutes um, according to my distant memory. And um, sometimes, you know, if the system was busy, this could still take a day or two uh, because of the sheer number of jobs per submission, um, but it moved a lot faster. Um, so my progression of use, I probably, used my category one form of computation for about a year before I added the third method and started using category two. Um, number three here is um, a one-off use case. Uh, my, my first set of simulations that I made my training database with ran on my computer just fine. Um, but the fast measurements did require some more detailed simulations so I was able to use CHTC for that because I needed this very specific environment and I could just uh, pop a Docker image in with my job and or my submission and it ran exactly as I needed it to. And um, by then I was a little bit better. It, it's, it felt like it happened really quickly. I didn't really have any problems. Um, so I was a little bit more advanced of a user at that point, but it was really cool just to be able to be like, oh, I have this other thing I need and use CHTC for that. Um, Eventually, I'm getting close to graduation and I need more calculations faster. So uh, they helped me uh, expand the UW grid and open science grid um, later uh, in 2021, closer to graduation. Um, other uh, cool things that I was able to use, um, I had a large input database. So I used the SWID um, to transfer, the SWID system to transfer that. Um, Migrating to the open science grid, I did get stuck for a few weeks um, where there was two different estimates of memory requirements and I was looking at the wrong one for a while. Um, uh, and so my jobs kept getting booted because I was under requesting memory for them. Um, so we figured that out and I moved along. Um, and then also I had these large data transfers of many small files um, uh, afterwards, after my uh, submissions were done and I was off campus, uh, you know, peak pandemic. So I was able to figure out um, a way to get um, all of my files directly from CHTC to the UW Research Drive. Um, and 
then the transfers didn't take um, an inordinately long amount of time. Um, so the impacts of CHTC on my research, I don't think my research would have been possible without it. Um, I mentioned the main thing driving my need probably was my database size. So it would have had to be much smaller, um, fewer parameter variations. And that fast measurement um, situation was kind of more my real world scenario. So I wouldn't have been able to have that um, because those simulations also required CHTC. Um, and here's a graph of kind of my big push for computing prior to graduation, um, which adds up to about 135 years. Um, so without CHTC, um, I would be talking to you at a ripe age of probably 171 or so years old, um, which I don't know that there's much life left in me at that point. Um, I did write about this research uh, for a general audience in my, in my dissertation. Um, there's a program on campus called the Wisconsin Institute for Science Literacy. Um, really, really cool. If you're interested and there's any grad students in the crowd, you should check it out. Um, there's some really, uh, really cool chapters there. Um, and that's where all of the little illustrations that I had in my talk um, came from. Um, HTC experience helps me with job interviews. Um, I'm kind of new at my current job, um, but the knowledge of how to design code in this way um, and interacting with job submission systems, I use that in my job all the time. So um, it, it was really wonderful experience to gain on campus. Um, and a lot of, lot of money went into this uh, research. So I have a really hefty acknowledgement slide. Um, of course, HTC, CHTC and Open Science Grid. Um, I mentioned the Wisconsin oh, Initiative for Science Literacy. Sorry, I, <laughs> I misspoke there. Um, and all the illustrations and a little bit of mild nepotism are um, done by my sister. Um, and I was funded by the Department of Homeland Security the National Science Foundation um, on campus. I got some funding from the Graduate Engineering Research Scholars, and I did um, get some funding from the Department of Energy and NSA through this consortium. Um, but most of all, I would like to thank my advisor, Paul Wilson, for getting me to this place in my life. So that would be it. All right, thank you.